On the podcast today, we are going to speak about chapter 56 of the Tao Te Ching, which makes up the 56th episode of the 81 Meditations on the Tao Te Ching. And as usual, Guyang will read Jia Fu Feng and Jane English's translation, and I will read Derek Lin's translation. Those who know do not talk. Those who talk do not know. Close your mouth. Guard your senses. Temper your sharpness. Simplify your problems. Mask your brightness. Be at one with the dust of the earth. This is primal union. Those who have achieved this state do not distinguish between friends and enemies, between good and harm, between honor and disgrace. This is the high state of being. Those who know do not talk. Those who talk do not know. Close the mouth, shut the doors, blunt the sharpness, unravel the knots, dim the glare, mix the dust. This is called mystic oneness. They cannot obtain this and be closer. They cannot obtain this and be distant. They cannot obtain this and be benefited. They cannot obtain this and be harmed. They cannot obtain this and be valued. They cannot obtain this and be degraded. Therefore, they become honored by the world. Like other chapters within the Tao Te Ching, they speak a lot about the divine attributes of the Taoist sage. And then this one, we're going more deeper into the character of the sage and actually how they are completely different from the average person and how they think and how they are influenced by the world. Yes, that's right. Again, the first uh, first lines already says those who do, do not know talk, those who talk do not know, right? And um, we talked about this many times, actually even the very... Uh, beginning of the Tao Te Ching is the first chapter. Those who can speak about the Tao do not know the Tao. Those who don't speak about the Tao do know the Tao, right? So again, the supreme knowledge of Tao or Brahman in the Hinduism is not the object of knowledge. It's not something that we can uh, understand or even try to comprehend with our mind, the thoughts, or even yeah, knowledge itself. So because those concepts are only can be understood or only can be known when you actually go beyond the mind. Yes. And it's interesting because in the Upanishads it says, those who know Brahman do not know Brahman. Those who do not know Brahman know Brahman, which speaks to your point because it's about the objectification of knowledge. You're making knowledge or the, the known felt experience an object of knowledge. So, for example, we could explain to everyone listening and watching about how Delhi is, for example. You can go to New Delhi in India. This is how it is. And we can describe as much as possible about what that is. But unless you've had an actual felt experience of being there, okay, some of the information is going to be useful, but then you realize that the map is not territory, right? And so that's where I think a lot of people get confused. They confuse the map with the territory. And so this happens a lot, particularly in Eastern spirituality. And that's why in a lot of these traditions, like what Lao Tzu is doing here, he's kind of warning people that language itself can fool you into thinking a, a certain way. Like, because you can objectify the knowledge of Tao, right? So the more you objectify that, the further and further and further you get away from the actual reality of what Tao is. And so that's a big problem. Now, they're not saying in the same sense, where a lot of Westerners get confused, that you shouldn't speak at all. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, a big mistake that a lot of Westerners think because they, they read particularly some poor translations of the Tao Te Ching where it, it kind of has an emphasis on not speaking at all. But kind of what Lao Tzu is saying here, it's, it's more so about this kind of psycho babble we have in our head, this chit-chat where we're const constantly find ourselves talking for no reason at all you know like a lot of people get uncomfortable in silence for example and they just talk about anything but Lao Tzu would say this is a, a big red flag because the more you do that the more you are going away from that kind of silence that that embrace of what that undifferentiated consciousness of Tao is because maybe you're trying to appease someone else or maybe you're trying or maybe you're accustomed to speaking all the time because you come from a culture where everyone just talks 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 mm -hmm. and talks and look there are a lot of talkative cultures around the world right and so in, in saying that you know talking itself can be a problem in and of itself so 
like Lao Tzu is saying, it's, it's a double-edged sword here. Like it's not saying that you don't speak at all, but it's saying that if you talk too much, of, in often cases you're speaking a lot from the noise in your own mind. You're not speaking from truth and you're not saying anything that's actually important. You're just speaking for the hell of it because that's what's going on in your mind. And, and that's a big problem for all of us. And that's why even in the Zhuangzi text, Zhuangzi emphasizes fasting the mind. And one of those is, is actually talking yes. because talking can create an energy in yourself that eclipses the Tao within yourself. That's right. I think having a conversation have two different um, transactions, two different ways of transaction. I think one is a transaction of energy. Let's say the conversation is how self have not much um, important meanings or um, yeah, the re relevance to the situation or whatnot. But it can be a good tool to have a transaction of a good energy between the people, right? Mm, yeah. And the other way is that um, content of conversation. Mm. If content of conversation is uh, fruitful and very uh, nutritious for um, yeah, the people who are in the com conversation, then it can be very beneficial, right? But I don't think uh, we use the conversation in the right way in these two different ways. It's more like like more like you said, the excessive talk, right? Mm. Um, yes, because you feel uncomfortable with being someone in silence, for instance, and we do feel it. But that doesn't mean that we have to make up something to talk about something. It can be something with the fruitful conversation can cover that space for a little while, but it doesn't have to be like constant talking <laughs> after. Yeah, but the chit chat is again the habit of our mind, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. uh, our mind doesn't stop thinking, unfortunately, especially these days because of a. Uh, um, activity of our mind is 24-7 with the phones and uh, constant loads of information and whatnot and our lifestyle became very very fast so that the mind activity is the doesn't cease to stop so that mm. translates to the, our the chit chat you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. so as much as the mind going busier and busier mm. we have more to speak about yeah. Right. Yeah. So we want to express what's going on in our mind. But in saying that, it's actually very good practice to stay silent in mm. that very situations, right? So um You don't need to feel uncomfortable. That's right. Mm. And those times we can somewhat reflect on our own thoughts, right? Like, oh that thought was a bit crazy or that's unnecessary or oh that was important. Okay, I will remember that mm. or Something like this. But that doesn't mean that you have to constantly be in your own thoughts, right? But again, silence that can be practiced outwardly mm. and also it can be translated into the inwardly as well, I think. So that's something uh, we need to all work on. And especially if we want to understand the concept of Taoism or Brahman, Sanatana, Dharma in this sense. Because the knowledge itself, again, cannot be taught correctly by words. It goes beyond the words. In Sanskrit, they say it's a prajna pramita, which is like a perfection of wisdom, or it can be translated into like an intuitive wisdom, right? Mm. So only when we get to that realm, then we can grasp what the Tao is, what the Brahman is, what the ultimate reality is. As you mentioned earlier with the Delhi, right? Like we can, because we recently was, were in Delhi, so we can explain how Delhi is like, uh, I mean, we can put as many vocabulary as possible that make can make the story rich and realistic for mm. everyone, but you will never know until you actually go there in person and physically experienced on the ground in the city with the people and the you know the noise and the air and all this entire environment um, there's something that you have to experience physically if you want to know about the place mm. so the felt experience is the only truth to every single individual that's right that's right and i like what you mentioned because you're referring to more of the humanness of Taoism. Whereas, as you said, with the transaction of energy, that is right. Like, there is that other side of the coin. And I th think that when you think about transaction of energy in conversation, usually when you haven't seen someone for a long time, 
you know, you, you, you're catching up. There's, there's a good energy, a good flow to the conversation. And I think what happens, like this happens between like work colleagues, happens between like friends or spouses and this and that. You see each other all the time and then the energy becomes stagnant. And so then what happens is you start chit-chatting about maybe you watched a show last night, purely insignificant, right? Like for example, if you hadn't seen a friend for a year, you're not going to speak about a TV show that you watch <laughs> you know, but you're not right you're going to be catching up on how they've been like what's been happening in their life and i'm pretty sure a television show is l- very low on their list of priorities and so that is right there is a transaction of energy to conversations and it can be like that all the time too it's particularly if you're very present in the conversation i think one of the points that louts is trying to point out is that we're not often present in conversations we're kind of listening to our own head. We're waiting for our own turn to speak. We're not actually listening to the other person. And so you just, a lot of things are going on in your own mind and then you just kind of re- spew this onto the other person and then they do the same. So there's a, there's a to and fro, right? Yeah. But there is a particular energy to conversations that we need to respect. And that, and that also is coming into alignment with an understanding of yourself the situation and everything like this. Like a lot of people when they come across Eastern spirituality, they think that they've just got to become a monk. So like if they haven't seen a friend for a year, right, they'll meet this friend and then they just sit there in a, in a lotus posture and then the other friend's thinking like, what the hell is going on here? Like he's not even talking. Like, And so you don't, you don't want to be one of those people, right, where you take it to its nth degree to prove something or to show that you're better than someone else. There's this very – there's this competi- competitive spirit in – westerners when it comes to eastern spirituality even with the first two lines in this chapter right oh you speak you speak too much so you don't know (laughs) there's a lot of this but then when you go to china or you go to india in these places people don't even think like that so westerners have this tendency to have this competitive spirit and they overlay this onto eastern spirituality whereas what you really need to have is what zhuang said is xiao yao yu you need to have free and easy wandering you need to have this ease natural ease in your life where you're not you don't care what someone else said you're not offended by words you don't care if they speak too much or too little you know if they're being a prick you just move yourself out of the way and and they can just be a prick by (laughs) themselves so you know you can do that right and i think there's just way too much focus like people focus a lot on words these days right so you and i we grew up in a culture where sticks and stones may break our bones but words will never hurt us now we've flipped that on its head words hurt us more than (laughs) the sticks and stones you know and so this has happened because of social media right people see a post that someone wrote and they instantly are like (laughs) you know like comment They're, they're so emotionally triggered because social media allows that type of behavior whereas we grew up when there was no social media and for example like the knowledge that i teach on the channel and what we speak about on the podcast we are speaking primarily about the knowledge our personal views we put to the side a lot of the time right and so you get people all the time oh jason thinks like this and (laughs) things like they they can't think with nuance you know so you shouldn't be offended by words You, you need to understand the knowledge as it is and not try and change it to how you understand it or think that you need to turn it into some type of competition between people. That's right. I think, uh, again, the spirituality became extremely materialistic in mm, a way mm. that the either you got to become stone Buddha. Mm. That's how you can determine someone is very spiritual. <laughs> or, um, or in a sense that people judge the someone who talk, talked a lot about philosophy or whatnot, then that person is not spiritual, right? It's not, uh, there is no healthy uh, medium between that. Mm. But either way, talk too much or being a stone Buddha, both ways are judged by materialistic point of view. Mm. That's the problem, I think. So that being a stone Buddha, again, doesn't mean that person is entirely spiritual at all. That person might be a bit too rigid in their own practice. They are kind of attached to the uh, attached to the practice itself. That that can be another uh, creating another bondage for that individual, right? Yep. Yep. That's something another thing that we need to be uh, cautious about. Mm. And the other way is that yeah, talking too much or yeah, talking not much at all is whether that's spiritual or not spiritual is not something that should be, 
how we should judge things, right? Mm. Again, the both ways are coming from purely a materialistic point of view, so that when we actually get to observe someone like, uh, let's say, um, Swamis in India or Taoist master of the like um, ancient China or someone who are in the mountain that we don't really know of. As you mentioned with the Zhuangzi, that they're very natural human being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the being spiritual means extremely uh, being a human being that both feet are standing firmly on the soil, mm -hmm. right? That's what it means to be a real, complete uh, human being, spirit, whether that you want to call it spiritual being or complete being. But in uh, Zhuangzi, uh, he would call it Zhen Ren, right? Mm -hmm. the genuine person, right? So th from that point of view, you don't have to make a judgment between this and that. Here in the last paragraph, saying there is no judgment between honor and uh, disgrace or friends or enemy, good or harm, because only what makes the distinction? Mm. The mind makes the distinction. So we want to go beyond that, right? And once you go beyond that, which is the right attributes to be a sage, then you don't have this or that or judgment of um, being spiritual or not spiritual doesn't really mean anything in the mm. end. What it really means is to be truest human being as you can be and genuine, honest human being you can be on earth as far as you carry this body. Mm -hmm. That's what the goal should be. And it should be to, well, in saying that, you're getting rid of the this and that in your mind. You're getting rid of the subjective viewpoint. But you're maintaining your own humanity. It's like you are you understand you're a human, but your head is absorbed in the divine so to speak like you mentioned with uh, fake spiritual people right who might speak very calmly <sighs> and be very disingenuous pretending to be spiritual but then you find out that they're more morally and politically leaning than they are spiritual mm -hmm. for example you can test anyone right i'm spiritual and this and that i meditate oh you speak too much and then you mention trump and then they get emotionally triggered. They fall off their chair. This is one person. And so then you say to them, you hate this one person that much. You can't talk about spirituality. And we've, and we've seen many people who pretend to be spiritual with that one word, they lose their mind. Imagine that. That's what spirituality is now. It's about politics. It's about getting angry at one person. It's about a certain political leaning. And spirituality does not lean left nor right. It's amoral. And a particularly Taoism is amoral. It doesn't have a, a, a moralistic leaning or a political leaning. And if you're one of those people who think it is and you're, you're going to shape and warp Taoism or Vedanta or Buddhism to that American political narrative, then shame on you. You should feel great shame. And there have been spiritual teachers who got so mad about that one word that they even wrote books about it <laughs> <laughs> and, Actually, yeah. and claiming to be spiritual. It might be, yeah. It might be actually a great uh, way to find find out if that person is, is a, a genuine spiritual person or not. Yeah. It's just one word, like you said, Trump. Yeah, yeah. Or um, yeah, U.S. Uh, election. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or something, something like that, so right? That, yeah. So then you you see that people are more politically oriented than they are spiritually. They're worried about politics. They're worried about one person, as if they are right and that one person is wrong. So you've already got an agenda. You already think your way is the best way. It doesn't matter what that other guy, who he is or what he believes or what he does. The problem is you because you think that you have the high moral ground over everyone else. And this is a, mainly only a big problem in America, but the problem is, is that a lot of the Eastern spiritual traditions went to America and are being warped by people who are really political they're not spiritual because if they were spiritual, they'd be talking about the actual philosophy and the knowledge and would not delve into politics, would not delve into silly progressive narratives that are floating around in places like America. Yes. You'd be focusing on what it takes to become a genren, like what you said, the genuine, authentic person, or what Thomas Merton would say, the true person of Tao. Mm. And so 
in this chapter, it actually, as, as we segue out of the first part of the chapter, it kind of goes into that element of what the attributes are of a genren, right? Of, of, and how that differs from the, the average J, Joe and Jane. And as to my point with that one word, you'll see that if you want to be a Dower sage, for example, you can't have these political leanings. You can't have this high moral ground where you think you're right and everyone else is wrong. Mm. You're going to have to wake up that other people think differently. <laughs> and in the West, there's this fundamental psychological trait which is related to difference anxiety. And so mm. people have this difference anxiety in, in the West Whereas when you go to India, there's no different anxiety because they've had numerous cultures, numerous different looking people for who knows how long. And so there's not a different anxiety. It's just like, oh, Guy Young does that. Betty does this. Michael's doing that over there. And who cares well, what they're doing? Like, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. As long as they don't harm me or incur harm on themselves, then we don't have a, we don't have a beef. That's so interesting because nowadays the this uh, diversity thing is a big thing globally, isn't it? Like uh, you gotta be um, multicultural. We gotta be um, open to. As if we're not multicultural exactly, already. Exactly the diversity and this and that. But again, like you said, there's some reason people have this uh, strange reaction when they actually experience experience or faced really different culture or language or different even way of life right mm. so again there's the <laughs> irony there in this in, in modern days as well that the, we thought that we came to such diverse culture but actually we won't yeah. in the end because just a few words can um, trigger someone's uh, belief or like a, have a, some just erratic reaction. It's a word. It's like a sound made with the tongue and the shape of the mouth, and, and that <laughs> that just can flip someone's. Yeah, like, you, you didn't yeah. get punched. You didn't get kicked. It's just a word, right? <laughs> exactly. It's just a word. Yeah. It's crazy. And and the irony there, like what you're alluding to, was in looking for diversity and inclusivity. They the whole fake narrative that you know particularly america is absorbed with is they think that that's achieved through exclusivity so if we highlight one culture over another or if we highlight this over that then surely that'll make everything inclusive and it's like no you, you know what you want to understand true inclusivity go to india and just everything's just running as it is and just you know don't interfere with people's lives this is a true path of uwe like that's the right. path of non-interference don't interfere with other people's lives. Stop telling others what to do. I know that, for example, in the West, they've bred a culture where you should just tell people what to do because, you know, they threaten your own survival, your own existence. And this is just, again, different anxiety, and this is an unfounded fear that is based on our own survival instincts when we were evolving, but we're overlaying that onto like you said, words or if someone thinks differently, who cares? <laughs> hey, someone put this up on YouTube. I'm so angry about it. Don't watch it. <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not that difficult. I'm going to leave a comment. Don't leave a comment. It's, it's like we, when you and I, we talk to people privately about how we've learned so much about the Eastern spiritual tradition since we were really young. We learned without social media. We learned without all of this and that. So we didn't learn, say, for example, Taoism, and then we read something and went, I don't agree with that. <laughs> you, I'm going to say something to uh, this gonna, author. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't have the opportunity. So what you do is you listen and you learn. Not that you agree wholeheartedly, like I was talk talking about before with my channel. It's... It's not that even like some of the knowledge I teach, not that I agree wholeheartedly with the things that, but I'm teaching the knowledge as it is. Mm. And what's to say about that? There's nothing to say. Like, so that's, again, what people need to think. You don't have to, again, if you're one of those people that will listen to a certain piece of knowledge and this and that, and then you get so emotionally invested and you need to write something about it, that's the first problem right there. You might want to learn this knowledge, maybe not by YouTube, but maybe by reading books. And so don't be worried about having to agree with everyone on everything, like I just mentioned. 
you can read books where it doesn't give you an option to comment. You, maybe you can go and comment later on on social media about what you disagree with. But try not to do that either because if you're invested in the spiritual path, it's not about commenting and having your opinion. Your opinion is based on your ego. The reason why these teachings are here are to crack your ego in half. It's not to enhance your ego, keep your ego alive. It's only your ego that gets a lot of the time angry about what it hears. And so that even goes with certain words, right? And so we have to have a focus on ourselves about how we speak, how we listen. And and if we are emotionally triggered, then it's not actually what's triggering you. It's you yourself that's the problem. Yes, uh, I think disagreement is, again, not necessarily a bad thing, but people take it as a bad thing. Like you said, there's something triggered within these individuals and they act very emotionally, right? And they want to express their reason why they disagreeing with the, what ever uh, been said and they keep pushing the other person to agree with the, their point of view right and that's the where the problem all begins but agreeing and disagreeing is i think always has been big journey of evolution of scholarship mm. evolution of scholarship always been a challenging each other's theories and opinions and different ideas right that's how knowledge always been um, evolved science, of course, and even uh, humanities studies, yeah. philosophy, psychology. If there was no challenge, uh, so disagreeing with one another, mm. without that, knowledge doesn't evolve. There is no more scholarship. That we will still be um, being the primitive knowledge of uh, Freud uh, psychology only, right? Yeah. There wouldn't be any evolution. So that's what people need to understand. Disagreeing with one another. Again, I guess they are making the dispute of their own ego, but disagreeing with one another is actually a healthy thing as a mature person to take because that is view if someone triggered you, that that person is was there to show you something within yourself to uh, challenge your belief, so to say, right? So yeah. it's a healthy. Well, that's why if you look at India and China, their evolution, why some of the philosophy and spiritual traditions are the best in the world mm. because of scholarship, because of the sages and the scholars and the philosophers challenging each other, not in an aggressive manner like you'd find in the modern day, but in a manner where everyone was trying to get to the bottom of it. Mm. What's the nature of consciousness? What's the nature of this reality around us? And they were all bought into that inquiry, but they came from different schools, right? So you had like, for example... During the Nalanda period, you'd have the Advaita Vedantists and the Mahayanas in conversation. During the Warren States period of China, you had the Taoists, the Confucianists, the, the Maoists. The list goes on. Manchus. Manchus. You have all of these different schools of thought, and they all have things to contribute to the greater understanding of that. And look, from a character and temperament perspective, you might resonate with one school over the other more. Like, for example, people listening and watching, and you and I, we would resonate out of the Chinese schools, obviously Taoism. Mm. But it's not to say that there isn't anything good that Confucius didn't say. I mean, he, he, he had some good knowledge, obviously Manchus, Shunzi, all of these type of philosophers and sages. But as a complete philosophy, okay, you could say Taoism is more complete, but it's not to say that, nothing, that other schools didn't have anything to offer. And it wasn't like there was one school of thought and all the other schools of thought got drowned out. Hmm. Okay, that eventually happened with Confucianism, right? Yeah. But I think that that was probably one of the things that happened in the West, particularly when Abrahamic faiths went West, is you had kind of one religion drowning out all of the other pagan traditions. Yes. But like in India, you I mean you've got Jainism, you've got the numerous uh, schools of Hinduism, Buddhism. Yeah. I mean, it goes on. Zoroastrianism. Yeah, so many schools so of, many sc yeah, Vedanta. Yeah, exactly. Vedas, it yes. just goes on and on. Yeah. And so there's a benefit of like exchange, yes. of knowledge exchange. Mm -hmm. As you and I are speaking here, like it's a knowledge exchange, right? We're mining the Tao Te Ching in the chapters and we're learning more about it as we speak about it Yes. as well, you know. Yes. Yeah, so in that sense, again, that we go back to that uh, talk, speech, 
the right speech. The, when we talk about knowledge, especially, we need to be more careful and cautious about not to overly talk or, or not to talk at all. <laughs> it, uh, find a, uh, find a, that the very good balance. And again, uh, the right speech is one of the, uh, the path of the eight, eight bold paths by uh, Buddha, the yep. Buddhism. So that's how important it is. And again, that, that w when it comes to knowledge, speaking of knowledge, the speech becomes much more important than just a chit chat. That's right. And you don't want to be an absolutist as well. I think that's one of the problems with people who be, who get interested in Eastern spirituality. They become absolutists. Oh, it's all Maya. It's all Maya. Why, why try? Or I am that. So why worry about all this knowledge? I am already that. And why I like Zhuangzi is Zhuangzi doesn't make any absolute claims. So he'll go, hmm, maybe you are that, but you don't really know. Or maybe it is Maya, mm -hmm. but we don't really know. That's right. So it's good in theory, and you can understand that from a deep uh, psychological and spiritual level. But Zhuangzi is still there going, you know, it's good what you're saying, but maybe not. Yeah. You have to keep that open. And so the beauty of Taoism and also uh, Zhuangzi himself is that he leaves reality open to be as it, whatever it will be doesn't make a grand claim. Obviously, you know, he talks about the Tao and, and this and that, but he's not completely like sold and steadfast on that. You know, He obviously does give us the knowledge of what, once we do break down this and that in our mind, we can then start to come into resonance with the Tao because you're out of the subjective view. But he doesn't take it any further than that. He doesn't say that then reality is itself an illusion. Like the physical world is an illusion, this and that. But he does say that the the, the illusion is, is dwells in our mind. It's not really anything to do with what's going on on out here. Mm. He's a big advocate of saying that you know na nature is completely innocent, including your body, and so it's something that you shouldn't ignore. Mm. Yeah, I think in a sense that the Zhuangzi are being that way. So he's radically accepting the humanness or, of humanity, basically, because. Let's say um, I like to um, drink water all the time. That's a, let's say the absolute claim you made it, right? <laughs> I, I, water is healthy for you, so that I'm just going to have water from now on all the time. Zhuangzi so might say, yeah, good. But for now, it, that's how it is for you. But mm. well, in a couple hours later from now, then uh, it might be different. Again, like uh, physically, naturally inclined to have something else, eat something else, drink something else, mm. is also part of nature, part of the Tao. So that, in a sense, that Zhuangzi is accepting the humanness of ourselves so that he always uh, warned people to make uh, absolute claim. Mm. You, can, you may feel like this right now, but that's not absolute. You might feel something different um, a day from now, right? So, again, being that uh, absolute human being and keep their humanness within you while you follow, the, the, again, the course of nature. Mm. And that's something what he would um, say, I think. Yeah, and he's saying, like, as you said, like, don't be attached to the transformations of life. Like you said, water's good now, but if I give you a gallon of water two gallons of water and I want you to keep drinking and I mean you're just gonna <laughs> drown <right? laughs> so like he's saying and you know the interesting thing is in him saying like becoming skilled at the transformations of life and moving with life mm. is you live more present right you live more in the now because you're, like you said you're not attached to what's going on back here or what's going to happen in the future you're just like you're moving like that leaf skillfully with the river and that's what Zhuangzi was he was like that leaf just flowing down the river mm not caught here or there, not trapped in a little psychological cul-de-sac, not told to think a certain way. He just freely moved and didn't have an absolutist view of reality. He just knew in his being the nature of the Tao and explained the process to get there, but didn't make an absolutist claim kind of, of what the Tao is nor what nature is, so right. to speak. So... To understand someone like Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu, we have to come back to, like they talk about in this chapter, the primal union, mm. 
the mystic oneness that they're talking about mm -hmm. uh, or that Chuang Tzu is alluding to that we can find. Yes. But he doesn't give it a name. Yes. Obviously, they gave it Tao because, you know, Tao is simple. And so as we were talking about, the, the attributes of people like that, of the Gen Ren. And so some of the attributes, as uh, Derek mentions in his chapter, we talk about closer, distant, benefits, harm, valued, degraded, right? Mm. And so what he mentioned by closer, what in his translation he mentioned by that was like being complimented, right? Or having flattery, like it doesn't really affect you per se, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not that you don't, you don't want to take that too far. See, it's dangerous saying these sorts of things because obviously if you said, look, good work, Guy Young, you'd say, oh, thanks. You saying thanks is not like you're, you know. Taking it. Taking yeah, it yeah, and pumping yeah, up your yeah, tires. Yeah, you're just yeah. being a kind person. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between like, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like where you're I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's See, a, yeah, now the, you know. There's a subtle difference, you know what I mean? Like, so, say, like, the thing is with the, with the Genren or with someone who lives in this mystic one, so this primal union, you can't appeal to their ego in that way. You know, hey, you're the best. And it's like, come on, man, please. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can't appeal because they don't, they, they don't really have that. Mm -hmm. They don't have that stickiness mm -hmm. in their being. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's a, you know, something that a lot of people like their ties pumped up. They right. like, they like getting flattered. They like, they like compliments when they actually don't deserve a compliment as well. Then you may say uh, thanks just to um, to give us some sort of response, right? Just yeah. to get, keep the good, um, you know, etiquette, and yeah. I, I guess. But not to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, see, this, yeah, this is me, this is mm, my... Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm number one. Yeah, yeah, nah, no, that's not... Yeah. Nah, nah. <laughs> so, and the next one, like, we, we, he talks about distant in his translation, so... This is like you don't need to be included in everything. Mm. And I think that this is something that a lot of spiritual people realize when they begin on the path that, first of all, you've gone in a different direction, right? So spirituality, and I mean genuine spirituality too, not, not the fake commodified spirituality, is you, you, you've gone in a different direction but you're still in the same life with other people where they're still traveling the same road that you are on, right? So they're still living the, you know, the life that they, they always had and they still think the same. They, mm. they don't understand reality at a more subtle level. But you're starting to see reality at a more subtle level and you're noticing things most importantly about yourself and not about the world that eclipse you from actually experiencing joy, freedom, peace mm. in life because you've been in your own way rather than the world being in your own way. That contentment usually can't come from things and externally. Mm. Obviously, you can put your life in, in a good stead. Mm. There's no doubt about that. But um, so a lot of people, and we've ha had many emails in the past from people saying like, you know, my family are dissociated from me now and friends, you know, how do I deal with this? And, and look, sometimes this is part and parcel mm. of the spiritual path. There's nothing much you can do about it. It's just that you've, you, you sometimes in some sense get comfortable in being alone. Mm. You know, you feel a real comfort in being alone, and and a lot of uh, sincere spiritual aspirants have that same sensation. Mm. And I had that since I was a kid. You know, I had a lot of friends, but I felt really comfortable being by myself mm. and just doing whatever my heart's content by myself. Yeah, I think a lot of people want to be always belong to mm. um, some sort of group or. Yep. It's just some group, I would say. Like that's whether um, your um, family group or mm. your friends or a nation, or it can be any kind of group. But we all want to be part of something, right? In that sense, you have a bit of a secu uh, security within yourself, psychological security in a sense. But if you feel you're alone, that you feel lonely, um, have a bit of a you know feeling that no one understands me no one knows me or um yeah but again once you're taking this path you're kind of uh, taking different direction voluntarily in a way so that that's something that you need to accept of course uh, at the beginning let's say okay the family and friends are kind of you know not interested in me anymore and this and that but at the beginning of course it's a very a painful experience but after a while, you realize that um, 
because you yourself were never really let's say vibe with them anymore mm -hmm. like uh, it, emotionally uh, you're not in on the same page with those people anymore because you are on a path of growth uh, spirit inner growth right so that um, accepting that is uh, another challenge but uh, you need to s slowly let go of that um, sense of uh, belonging to your friends and family. I think eventually you want to detach from that emotion. You Only what bothers you, bothers you there, is that just the emotion that you had with them in the past memory, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's what you always relate to, fond memories of your siblings, parents, cousins, friends, and whatnot. And usually those... Um, Good memories uh, touches, touch you in a good way. Emotionally, feels good, right? And that gives you psychological security. You feel taken care of, right? But once you take in a different path, again, it's a transformation of life. Life goes uh, in its own way, in its own course. So, but if you incline to go that path, then you need to slowly, slowly um, detach from that emotion from of course memory is nothing wrong with it mm. a good good emotion yes it's always um, will make us feel uh, good fulfilled at times when we look back in our childhood and whatnot but attach once you attach to it then the problem begins so you need to slowly practice to detach your emotion to leave the good memory as it is but you don't have to be attached by it i think the revealing thing for everyone when they encounter that is that and we've all experienced this where you can become interested in different things and do different things and then your family and your friends will usually be like, oh, yeah, cool, man, like, you know, be supportive and this and that and interested. The deep contemplative traditions of the East are, is a bridge too far. It's something that's way over the horizon. And I think that's what a lot of people have to realise that for people who have, or, or, or who have no connection to the deeper knowledge... Mm. It's, it's a, it truly is a bridge too far. And so that's got nothing to do on you per se. It's just a, a lot of the time it's just that they don't understand it. So they, the, the sad thing is people think because they don't understand it, they don't understand you. Mm. you know, so yeah, they don't understand the knowledge that you are, are interested in. Yes. And that, so, yeah. so then they think they don't understand yes, you. Yes. And see, that's the big mistake. And I think so then you don't really have to take it personally. Yeah. It's it's sometimes it's a, a human trait. If people don't understand something, they they might feel inadequate or they might feel that you know something more than them. I mean, that's a survival tendency, and it's kind of sad that a lot of people can still think like that. But as a spiritual aspirant, you shouldn't take it personally. Mm. You need to move on, and like you said, and, and, and in some sense in moving on, it's not that you don't love your friends and your family. It's just that you have a distance between them now, mm. and it's a healthy distance. Mm. It's not something that is a negative thing. You don't need to think of it as, as a negative thing. You still love and appreciate them, but there's a healthy distance there because there's something in your life now that it is taking the centerpiece. And in the end of the day, that'll be with you to the end of days. Not everybody else will be with you to the end of days. So it's something for people to think about. And the next part, like Derek mentions, as one of the attainments of mystic oneness is, is like benefits. So... This is, should be a no-brainer. This is about being compromised through greed or what people would say like selling their soul, right? So a lot of people will – and I don't think that you need to think about your life like in that way, right? Oh, I sold my soul for this and that. Look, sometimes people make all sorts of decisions when they're put up against a wall. And I think you have to think about yourself with a little bit more tender care, mm. you know. There's a difference between you making a certain decision for money because you needed to in a certain time than to really selling your soul. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you could sell your soul to a, a, the global elitist, for example. Okay, you're selling your soul. But if you're just getting a job because your family need to earn money and you need to take this job that kind of sucks the life out of you, mm. but it contributes, you know, groceries every week for your family, keeps your kids and you your spouse happy and mm. you shouldn't think about it in that way. Yeah, it's more practical sense in that of situation. Course. You need to think a little bit differently. It's not really about taking your, uh, selling your soul in that case. Yeah. No. 
But in saying that, like, you still should have a mind of not being compromised by greed. Mm. Like, you should think about your life more than money, right? You, you should have something at least in your life that that really gets you out of bed in the morning and gives you excitement and something that you can work towards and you can progress in, so to speak. That could be anything. could be music, could be building a house, or it could be just something that keeps your mind active and centered and present but isn't about making money. Mm. And that's why I think, like, if you look at the artists of today, the they are nothing of the artists of yesteryear. Yeah. You know, if we look at classical music, right, people always say, oh, why is there no Beethoven, no Mozart, and, you know, so forth and so on? Well, they lived in a completely different world, mm. which I'm guessing they didn't have much external stimuli going on. They didn't have Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. And then so when your mind is very quiet, you can produce great art. It's a reflection of the life you've had and, and a kind of a reflection of the, your own soul, which is being expressed. In this day and age, we don't even know that there's anything in, within us. We don't know our raw material because right. we're dwelling on the surface. Hey, did you see what someone said about my post? Mm -hmm. Come on, seriously, it's a post. I can burn all of social media down and it will only do better for the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, It's not yeah. going to leave yeah. any scars. And so next we come to harm. And so this is an interesting one because Derek's kind of saying that the sage is not threatened by the world or by mm. people. Um, they're not intimidated actually because they don't have this, you could say, ego to protect or mm. this, this sense of identity that they need to protect. Or an acceptance of life. Yeah. can be right like yeah. for example we went through the pandemic for two three years right and um, some people really react very uh, immediately and very like uh, they are completely the, like they went out panic of yeah. out of fear yeah, yeah, yeah out yeah. of fear like complete panic mode mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. or some people were a bit more like uh, ah, okay like what's going on and th some people would uh, approach it a bit more um, with the ease, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when the external threat happens and people uh, react differently, at different degrees, because yes, uh, the, let's say a sage uh, accepts the course of life. Mm. And some things, just like uh, earthquakes, just like flood or mm. drought, these things uh, are out of our control, right? Sometimes uh, things don't go our way and uh, the problem happens when we try to control the situation, right? Mm. Sometimes you need to be able to um, accept uh, the reality that you, we are facing. In that way, actually, you can find a real true solution within that situation instead of um, reacting erratically and panicking. <laughs> and like, then usually when we are in that uh, state of mind that we make wrong decisions. Yeah. And... and you don't want to think that the, the Taoist here or, or Lao Tzu is just walking around aloof and he's just like, I'll just let the Tao guide me, dude. It's nothing like that. Like Taoism in some sense is a humanistic spirituality that in, in certain aspects can be very practical. So Lao Tzu would say here, like if you're talking about harm, you need to take the necessary precautions to protect yourself and the life of the ones you love. Not in a, not in a sense of fear, but in a sense of strategy and just being wise about it that's right you know if you don't have much water it's probably a better strategy to get some water tanks and you know it's, it's a very practical philosophy sometimes in that sense you don't want to over exaggerate that because a lot of people will just exaggerate like okay man I, I don't care about harm anymore i don't need to protect myself and it's like well he's not really talking about that it's it's that he doesn't need to protect his own sense of identity but when it comes to his his, his whole whole being I mean, obviously, you need, you need food, clothing, and shelter. All humans need food, clothing, and shelter and deserve food, clothing, and shelter. So you don't want to over-exaggerate that. Now, the next attainment of mystic oneness that Derek was talking about is being valued. And so this one is pretty obvious, right? Because we grow up in a world where we are actually taught to feel worthless, mm. right? Oh, you're nobody until you're somebody, Hence the whole self-help movement. And so it's built on the illusion that you lack, the illusion that you're worthless. But you are worth everything. You are valued. You're intrinsically valued by the world. You don't need someone to value you. 
And so in talking about this, the obvious, the obvious aspect of that is fame, right? So people will seek attention to feel worthy. But the Jenren, the Taoist sage, seeks no attention at all. They are completely comfortable in their own skin and they go about their life as it will. They don't need someone to, to evaluate their life or to measure them against something else. And they also don't, conversely, measure their life against anyone else's. Mm. And I think that one of the big sicknesses in the modern world, not just the West, but even in places in Asia and South, South America and Africa and places, is that people are constantly measuring their life against someone else's because of social media now, right? Why has Guyang got this car? Why has she got this? Why is she, ha- why is she smiling? Because I'm not smiling at home. <laughs> and so then you, you develop this cult of comparison. Yeah. And so Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is a thief of joy. Mm. And nothing could be more of a true statement than that. Yeah. And I think that when you talk about value and you talk about being worthy, you have to wind back your expectations mm. and not listen to what the world tells you. Yeah. You know. So it's not just America that tells people that, right? In Australia, Korea, they tell you that, hey, you should be someone. Why aren't you someone? And and according to them, someone is someone who's on TV or someone who gets a lot of likes uh, and views on YouTube, for example, or a musician that's loved or you know, so forth and so on. Yeah, the value is something that um, you can actually create yourself to be honest Mm. right like um you value certain things and you apply that to yourself right then you become again let's put the comparison aside that's just ridiculous talk Mm -hmm. right and uh, again like uh, people what people don't understand is that those people who seem to be super successful and wealthy and whatnot um, they have different circumstances, and we don't know those people' um, mm. private life. Mm. That might so. be miserable. That might be um, uh, suffering from a huge debt. Or nobody knows, right? So, um, again, like uh, what's been displayed on the social media is never the true. We know that, no. and um, being upset about other people's successful life is quite uh, stupid. Right. So again, like uh, you yourself can uh, bring the value into your life, and that's how your life and yourself becomes valuable. Mm. So it's actually pretty simple. And ironically, look at how many famous people commit suicide. Look how many people who are well known feel empty. Yeah. Because the adulation, the fame, and all of that is not genuine. Mm. It's just not genuine. And so. People need to, you know, refrain from that yearning to to be somebody, yeah. and understand that you innately have value. You don't need someone to tell you that. It's like the old Sanskrit phrase, "Sat Chit Ananda," mm. existence, consciousness, bliss. So you, I exist. How good? Consciousness. How good? Ananda. Yes. You don't need anything. Yeah. It's actually the the reverse of what we think leads to joy. Mm-hmm. Hey, I need all of these things to have joy. Well, not what they're saying in the Upanishads. <laughs> Sat chit ananda. Yeah. You need to rewind your life and then you'll have joy and then you'll feel content. That's and true. then you'll understand that you already have value. You don't need to add things to your life to have value. Mm. And so the last part that Derek says within the chapter is degraded, being degraded. So the threat or the fear of defamation from others or you know being excluded from others and or being criticized by others yeah. as if that their opinion matters mm-hmm. right and so i think that the world that we've created you know we talk about social media a lot is we've created this world that if someone doesn't agree with you or they cancel you or whatever that means a person is not a subscription television and so you can never be canceled and so that type of aggression and passive aggressiveness is more reflective of the people doing it than yourself. Again, we talked about words. Most people who try to cancel someone is over words, right? It's not over actual actions, not over things that really harm people. And so if you feel like you've been defamed and you feel the fear of that, you feel the pain of that, then you've brought too much into who you are as well. That's right. 
Again, that's a kind of a reputation thing, isn't mm -hmm. it? Like uh, someone tarnish your reputation. Again, you believe too much in your own reputation. Then yep. you are too attached to um, uh, reputation, whatever the reputation is, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like you said, in the end, at the end, um, that's purely just a reaction of others. Mm. Think of uh, what uh, what they think of who you are, right? Mm. And again, you're not responsible of what they say. Really, it's their problem, mm -hmm. and um, you need to keep that in mind. And also, yeah, you are not this image. You are not this um, social status or role that you play or. You are not that. You need to really know that this is only the role that you are playing in this physical world, and you are not that, mm. right? You are not that uh, boss or employee or whatever you are in the the position in society. That doesn't determine who you are, right? Mm. So yeah, you need to keep that in mind, and again, the not let that get to you, right? Mm. You should not get that um, judgment of others get to your head basically yeah so like a sage knows who they truly are so it couldn't it doesn't matter what anyone says and so we need to have that same sort of mentality it doesn't matter what anyone says about yourself it doesn't matter most of the time they're speaking about the role that you're playing in life they're not actually speaking about who you truly are mm. and so you're trying to protect the role or you're trying to protect who you truly are tell me which one it is and most of the time it's the role that you play yeah. you know so like you said, like it's it's all about reputation. The, the reputation is attached to the role. There is no reputation for the undifferentiated Tao <laughs> within you. It doesn't need reputation. There is no such thing. It's imminent within all life and also transcends it. So it doesn't need anyone's validation. doesn't need anyone's defamation. It doesn't care. <laughs> and so we need to have that same mindset. And so the sage has that mystic oneness where they're not blown here or there because someone says something. Hey, this person cancelled me, and who is that person? Nobody. So why do you care? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's more on them. They're creating more negative karma for themselves than you are. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of feeling their karma, mm. and the feeling of their karma doesn't feel right. Right, yes. Because there's a lot of pain and frustration, jealousy and envy in it. And most of the time when people try to defame someone else, it's because the people doing the defaming have jealousy, envy, and feel inadequate at someone else's success or someone else's mm -hmm. way of being. And I think if you're true to yourself, as in a true sense of the, your own true being, then you wouldn't be touched by whatever other people say, mm. right? That doesn't mean anything to you, no. right? So if you uh, you stand strong in your own uh, self existence, pure existence, then yeah, whatever they say is their opinion, and you are strong enough to not to be touched by it. That's right. You just can move on. Doesn't yeah, matter. That's right. These days, you have your block delete button. There you go. Like if someone's been really negative towards you and you don't know them and they're a coward behind their screen with Cheetos all over their face in their grandma's basement, then you don't need to worry about them at all because they've got more things to worry about than you do. Yeah, keep your energy for yourself, right? Why keep, waste? Yeah, because that's the, one of the worst things about social media is you know this anonymity that people can have and has kind of given people this protective shield where... We know from running my channel, we get all sorts of sad individuals saying crazy things and we really feel for them. So it's better not to converse with them, but just to block and delete because you don't want to contribute to probably the sad psychological state that they're in. And so that's not something for other people to think about. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't be accountable for their actions. They should, and they will be judged harshly. And the karma they're accumulating will have to be dealt with. Yeah. But... You don't ever want to be that individual. And, you know, remember, people say things that are always going to differ that from what your opinion is. But are you listening? And can you listen to a, a differing opinion? Can you just be who you are without worrying about what someone else says? Words don't affect you. They, they, they can never affect you. You can say, yes. you know, so we need to think about that. And if we really want to embody these kind of six attainments of, the, of mystic oneness that the genuine has, then it's, it's a real realisation 
that our identity doesn't really exist. And that doesn't mean that you don't exist right now when you're not experiencing the reality that you do. But it's the subjectivity that you've built in your mind, this conditioning that you have, these rose-coloured glasses that you see reality. That's the real illusion. And that's what Lao Tzu is trying to say in this chapter of the Tao Te Ching. That's right. So, guys, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you guys next time.